Great. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I thought today that because we're in lockdown and uh, things could be a little bit more cheerful, I thought I'd talk to you about something which has amused art historians for generations um, and which I think raises the question of humour. You can look at what I'm going to talk about today, these wonderful marginal images uh, in all sorts of different ways. And I thought because it's lunchtime, we'd start with some fish and chips or at least we think we can start with a little bit of a little bit of tasty wildlife. This is a skate. I just want to start with a, an initial observation about medieval art, which is that in, in England particularly, people loved beautiful drawings of wildlife. The only thing is that they did tend to frame them with a sense of humour. If you had gone to Great Yarmouth in 1330, you would have found skates. Did I do say maybe not fish and chips? And the skates would have looked possibly like this. They would be uh, enormous uh, great creatures. Of course, this is a fiction. Actually, skates, flat fish can grow to be quite, quite big. But can you see how beautifully drawn it is? This is a guy, um, understandably frightened by an absolutely enormous flat fish skate, beautifully observed with those mad staring eyes out of the water. And I just want to bring, bring this in. I'm going to show you quite a lot of images today that come out of illuminated manuscripts, which are dated off into the 13th and 14th century. Professor, could I just ask, could you just maximise your PDF? We just had a comment come in, just, just make it bigger. Yeah. Perfect. Is that all right? Cool. Are you with me now? Great. Um, yeah, the, the, these manuscripts often have uh, text in them, and the, the, that can sometimes help us. Here, this man, he's kind of thrown back in absolute horror at this kind of Monty Python-like spectacle of this vast fish. And I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor there running? Uh, that's a help because you can see, look closely at the, the, the word here, of course it's, it's, uh, it's in Latin, it's from a Psalter, the book of Psalms, and uh, the, the phrase here is non temebimus, non temebimus, that, that is to say, this is from, um, this is from Psalm, um, are you picking that up okay? I'm paging down. Uh, Psalm 46, Proctorea non timabimus dum tua barbita terra. That is to say, um, you know, we're not, we, we're not afraid. Even though the earth is shaking, we are not afraid. And yet here, this man is emphatically uh, afraid. We need to see these things in some sort of context. See, here, here's, here's the whole context. And the Latin goes across here, here like this. What's going on here is the, an important initial point about medieval art. You know, it uses text. It's often about meaning and it's often about wit and punning. It's about play, uh, and, and the play can be popular, the play can be quite intellectual and quite high-minded, but very often these monsters and other visions that you see in the margins of pages uh, uh, have actually nothing to do with the real world. You know, they're, they're a kind of nonsense world, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about images on the edge of pages or on the edges of churches as, it, as things that produce a certain kind of experience as well as having a certain kind of meaning. They don't, they don't just simply mean things. They make us laugh. They create delight in us. Let's just think for a second. Um, there's the uh, next slide, which is a, I hope you can all see that. It's a page from the Peterborough Psalter in uh, Brussels. It's a beautiful book, really spectacular book that was illuminated for Peterborough Abbey around 1300. Let's just look at it closely for a moment because <clears throat> you can see at the top of the page, it's beautifully written. Look how fine the script is. Uh, there's a large initial B. And uh, next to it are the words, the letters, Beatus Vir, qui non abiet. This isn't a Latin lesson, folks. All I want to make is this point. B, the B, Beatus Vir, is the first psalm of the book of Psalms composed by King David. And here's David himself, King David, who is playing a harp. He's got musicians next to him. And he, the psalms open with this idea, Beatus Vir, qui non abiet in concilio impurum, which is to say, happy, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. It, the very first word lifts our spirits and uh, reminds us that the word psalm comes from a Latin word, salire, to dance or to leap or to jump, to jump with joy. And what do we find in the borders? We find beautifully observed animal life, wonderful birds. We find a man on his stilts. We find uh, a, a man in armor. We find a hunt. I'm going to talk quite a lot about hunting at the bottom. Here's a man with a bow and arrow and a stag. And at the top, you can probably just see, I hope you can see this, a fox running away with a chicken and an owl and a monkey riding backwards 
on a goat with a great shaggy goat with his horns like this. What on earth is going on here? That's the point. Works of art like this in the Middle Ages don't simply tell you what to think. They ask you a question. What are these things doing here? And it's up to you, the reader, to try to find out the answer. In, in that sense, you know, we may think of medieval art as about obedience and religion and authority. It isn't. It's about a certain kind of pleasure and fun. The, the religion doesn't have to be completely serious. Now, in our uh, history of uh, in the history of art, art historians and how people have written about this things, these things since the 19th century, there was a tendency, and it, it went through the 20th century actually, to look at these marvelous marginalia as if, well, they were either kind of documentary, they documented real life. I'm showing you a page from a very well known book published in the 1950s by a famous art historian and architectural historian called Sir Nicholas Pevsner. You may, many of you, of course, have come across Pevsner. Well, Pevsner wrote a book uh, on the Englishness of English art, which said that this was a peculiarly English phenomenon. That's not quite right, it has to be said, but he was very interested, for example, in, here, here we are, this is a, a great Psalter from the 14th century, the Lutchville Psalter, I'm gonna be talking about that again in a second. Um, how you treat wildlife, how these things uh, have to do with observed life and, and reality. Well, that's almost true. There was a tendency in the 19th century and 20th century to think of these marginal things as being about morality and about, you know, uh, reality. They're not simply about that. They're about nonsense, too. And um, that's the point I want to get on to. I hope you can all see the lateral assault here. Here's a, here's a spread from this famous, famous book. It's in the British Library. And it was made for this man here, um, Sir, Geoffrey Sir Geoffrey Luttrell, who is seated on his... A uh, horse, I guess you could say this is the equivalent of, this is the 14th century equivalent of a, of a, of a tank or a Mazda. It's a kind of beautifully tra trapped out horse with heraldry. And there's his, uh, his wife and his daughter-in-law giving him his heraldry. And he commissioned around 1340, this Psalter, Book of Psalms, with the most spectacular and the most famous marginal decorations of pretty well any book of the period. It was quite clearly an attempt to outdo any other, any other book. The, the arms of the laterals appear everywhere. They have birds on them like this. You get a lot of winged creatures, fantastic creatures with wings and flippers. And um, very often people turn to the lateral psalter for nonsense, as well as for a certain kind of documentation, because this book is famous too for the pictures in the borders where you get scenes from everyday life. Here's a plow going on, for example. Here's a guy with a slingshot driving off crows from a field. And the lateral psalter is a kind of classic instance of a certain kind of social realism, if you like. Um, here is harvest time, a guy gathering up at the harvest with his scythe, a peasant. And at the same time, we also have images that are in no sense realistic at all. This is a good one. Here's a bull or an ox at the bottom looking kind of depressed. And this man really does need to be looked at quite closely. And there are hundreds of these things in the Lutchville Psalter. He's, with his hand, I don't know if you can see this, he's operating a little stick. And at the end of the stick is a puppet. Uh, so he's got a little mannequin on his head. And then as a hat, he's wearing an Eleanor cross. One of these crosses that was set up in the 1290s to, to um, mark the funeral cortege of Queen Eleanor of Castile. She died in 1290 in Northampton. And she was uh, in Nottinghamshire, rather, and she was taken down to Westminster. And every time the funeral cortege stopped, a beautiful cross was erected. Well, they're pretty serious things. This is not a serious use of, a, of an, a, an Eleanor cross. Don't try this at home. You can't just pick these things up <laughs> and run off with them. At least you can, but you can in a world of nonsense. And nonsense as something serious, as nonsense as something which reminds us that all this is part of God's creation. We tend to think of margins and centres as being like a binary. It's like a Robin Hood world of them and us and the margins subverting the centre. I see it slightly differently. I think this is all one statement. It's all one aspect of a bigger truth, which is that in the Middle Ages, before we became the modern and rather more Protestant and, could, and in, in many ways reformed and disapproving society that, 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 that we did in the 16th and 17th century, in the Catholic medieval world, the boundaries that we now recognize didn't exist around what was fun and what was serious because the, the playful and the serious went hand in hand. So I like to think of these things as working seriously together. So let's go on. And just to make another point, you know, these things weren't invented in the Middle Ages. Here's a point in 
a, 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 point, a point for comparison. Here's a, a figure from the Luttrell Sultan, a typical border piece of nonsense in a way. It's a woman with little corner um, plates of hair, long headdress like that, and her body slowly elongates and then turns into a great scaly thing like that. And then she's got these bird-like feet. There's a lot of feathers and birds in the Luttrell Sultan. I think it goes back to the, the heraldry, the arms of the Luttrells. But look at this. This is in the Getty Museum. It's a Roman sculpture of a woman who, whose body does exactly the same thing. It turns into a sort of bird-like, skinny leg thing. That's several centuries before. This isn't simply a Christian thing. If in the Middle Ages you were interested in poetry, you might very well open a, a famous book on authorship by a poet called Horace, the Roman poet Horace, the Ars Poetica. And it actually opens, the very first thing it opens with is, is by saying, uh, look, I'm really sorry, this book may be nonsense because it's really rather like one of those figures that you see with a man's head bolted onto a fish and, you know, wings and all the rest of it. Um, these may be errors of style, but the Romans were talking about this as a, from the point of view of satire, and it gets picked up in the, in the medieval world. And then we find it all through the Middle Ages. Um, this, is a, this is one of my favourites. As, as, as a boy, um, I, was, I, loved, I became a medievalist because of the Battle of Hastings in 1066 and all brought in 1966 when I was a little boy. A lot of celebrations, and I bought a little book of the Bayer Tapestry. Here's the Bayer Tapestry. One of the most famous and miraculous works of art, if it ever ends up in this country, do go, do go and see it. It's the most wonderful thing. And um, it, <laughs> there was a section in, in my little sort of schoolboy's book which said, there's one picture that we really don't feel adds anything to the story, so we've decided to, we've decided to miss it out. Years later, I discovered what that picture was, and here it is. And I can see why they cut it out, because it's not really suitable for a family show. Anyway, there is a clerk. Uh, he's got a tonsil, so he's a priest. And he's, he's reaching across and chucking a woman's face. She's called Elfgiver. It says, where a certain clerk and Elfgiver, dot, 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 dot. In other words, there was a bit of hanky-panky. And of course, what the border does is to tell us the truth. It's the sort of aside, yeah, this is what was really going on. This is, this is, this is a bit naughty and so on. It doesn't subvert the meaning of the central text, but it kind of enriches it and it makes us, it makes us think and it amuses us, you know, it, 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 it engages us. And I think this key thing of engagement is very important. Now, if you go into many, many parish churches, particularly a bit later on, the Bear Tapestry's 11th century, you know, in the 13th and particularly the 14th century, go into a parish church, you're going to see all sorts of things in, in wood carvings, in stained glass windows, in sculptures, this kind of thing here. This little man is in the south aisle of the parish church at Cly in Norfolk. And Norfolk, uh, of course, had a big sea, sea going, seafaring economy, and Cly was a little port. And this guy, I don't know if you can see this, I hope it's coming across loud, loud and clear, um, but he's kind of got his bottom exposed here like this, so his, his ass is pointing down to the spectators, and you can just see his, his testicles there like this, and he's dropped his pants and he's waving his bum uh, at the people in, in the aisle. Why on earth, you might say, is this, is this permissible? Is this a church? And the answer is they didn't think like that in the Middle Ages. It's all God's creation, if you see what I mean. There isn't a problem with this kind of thing. It offends our sensibility and our tendency to think in terms of you know, two binaries, this is good and this is bad. They didn't think like that. So you'll see lots and lots of things like this. They're not to do simply with popular culture. They're not to do with elite culture. They're everybody's culture. I think Peter at the start talked about the parish church being a dem democratic place. That's a really good way of understanding this, that this is where all the classes can get together and they can all share a joke, I would like to maintain. There are really good instances of this kind of thing in churches and cathedrals. If you go, for example, to Norwich, uh, go to the cloister in Norwich, that's got a marvellous display of bosses and trolleries and grotesques. Um, there's a little episode here, uh, which um, is one of dozens I could have chosen, and it shows a washerwoman whose uh, laundry is being nicked by a youth in sort of red underpants, and she's been dry drying the laundry, and he's, he's running off with, with her knickers, and he, uh, she's beating him about the head with a stick. And you might say to yourself, well, what is this doing in a cloister? This is for the monks. I mean, surely monks are more serious minded than that. And the answer is, well, they're not. Uh, uh, very often the rudest pictures in uh, monasteries and cathedrals go to the Lady Chapel of Ely. Oh, that's another story. My word, the sex and the violence and the booze is all for the monks. It's not for the ordinary people. This is a cloister, a place of calm and tranquility and study. And here we have a, a sort of 
typical 14th century Norwich streets. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, look what it goes next to. These are right next door to one another. Here's the lady having her laundry net. And here, just, just, just uh, nearby, is the central event of the Christian religion. God dying for us on the cross. There's a little image of Christ on the cross with St. John and the Virgin Mary. And then underneath is a green man, uh, one of these, you know, fertility, paganish things that uh, he's staring down at us balefully. And just around the corner, you have these. And you see, they all work together, but they don't create chaos. They just create a sense of the truth of reality, which is that it isn't all sublime. The, 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 the good and the bad always go together, hand in hand, the funny and the serious go hand in hand. And you can see that beautifully there. All the colouring on these bosses, by the way, is uh, modern, but uh, they're very, very, very fine. Um, here's another one. I've taken a liberty in my caption to describe what's going on here. This is a, 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 another Psalter uh, book of Psalms, the Macclesfield Psalter, which we acquired actually at the Fitzwilliam Museum in 2005. And the Monty Python team got very interested in this because of the huge number of weird things going on in the margins. Terry Gilliam, who, who did the cartoons of the Monty Python series, loved this kind of thing. And if you see what's going on here is quite serious. This is a page um, from a part of the religious services of the church called the Office of the Dead. Very solemn office. And um, you can see in Vigilia Mortuorum, it says there at the top here. And here is a poor man dying in bed. There's his wife with her hands up, sort of grieving. And death, the figure of death in a sort of great greasy uh, shroud has jumped up onto the bed and is skewering the man in the chest like this. The figure of death is a new invention at that time, early 14th century. We're just getting up to the age of the Black Death, by the way. Um, so death is with us, he'll jump onto your bed and there's nothing you can do about it. He's dead, but he's forceful. At the bottom, pride falls off a horse. Do you remember the saying, pride goeth before a fall? Pride was always shown falling off a, falling off a horse. And then opposite, you know, figure, there's a, a gorillus, a half man, half set of legs. He's got no body. He's, he's kind of being bolted together and he's holding a, a piss pot. And here is a man peeing into it. Um, <laughs> well, again, dot, 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 you know, what is going on here? Are they taking the piss, possibly? Is it, is it the idea that, you know, you, you examine urine in the Middle Ages, the doctor will come to your bed and look at your urine to see what the health is like? Is it, is it a take on that? Who knows? What, what is it that associates all those kind of things? And do you say I put that as a question? I didn't put it as an answer. It's asking you a question. Now, Let's get on to sex, at least <clears throat> let's get on to fertility and how these animals um, uh, uh, all kind of fit into this. And when I say sex, what I really mean is uh, the kind of upper class sex that goes on between the people that own books of this nature. Because well, remember one thing, it's one thing to see something in a parish church that may have been carved uh, in a corner. It's another thing to look at a book like this, which nobody could afford to be up below the wealth of the average aristocrat. This is a book of hours in the Fitzwilliam Museum. It's called the Clifford Pabernum House because of the two families who were commemorated in the, in, in the book. Um, and here they are, the Cliffords and the Pab Pabernums, Mr. and Mrs. And they're kneeling before a figure of the Holy Trinity. And look at their heraldry, look how they've got their coats of arms on them. There's the Mrs. again with God. And the point I want to make about this is that these are upper class clientele. The people that did the marginal illustrations in these books, and the Book of Hours is the most famous prayer book of the 14th century. It's coming into fashion around this time. It replaces the Psalter. It has within it the, the services of the church so that you can do this at home. Just imagine these people under lockdown in their castles and they want to have the services of the church, seven, seven services a day, eight services a day. They can do it from the, from the Book of Hours, which takes them through the day. Anyway, the point is that they've got heraldry everywhere. These books are, are very fine. They're not necessarily used a great deal. And the reason that they're so splendid is because they're wedding gifts. They're gifts from one family to another to celebrate the union of two young people in a marriage. And the heraldry is there to, to uh, mark that and commemorate that. The point I want to get across is the, the fact that they have hunting in them. Here's a hunt going on at the bottom of the guy with a bow and arrow. Beautifully observed birds, dogs, and a stag, a goat, birds, yet more, yet more bunnies and dogs and shenanigans at the top of the page like this. The upper classes are there because they own land. We live in a, in a money economy. In the Middle Ages, what decided your, your position in the pecking order was whether you control land. 
whether you wore fur, whether you wore bits of dead animal, that's what told us that you were important. So land, family, marriage, dynasty, all, all mattered. And fertility mattered because, of course, you had to hand the land on to your successors. And so a lot of these books have images in them that have to do with fertility. And the, the, the borders quite often take the mickey, it must be said, out of the serious stuff that's going on in, in, in the text. For example, apes. Monkeys, to, to ape something is to imitate it. So here's a little book of ours. I was saying, or uh, in fact, it's a little, um, little psalter. And it, uh, there, there are two clerics singing from a, from a lector. And they're, they're singing, uh, I sing unto the uh, Lord a new, uh, the new song. Uh, and the, the little ape is taking, uh, taking the mickey out of them at that particular point. So he's become like a clerical figure. Yeah, bunnies. There was a famous aristocrat in the 14th century who commissioned a lot of books of this type and was well known to people in East Anglia, John de Warren, Earl of Surrey. Uh, he owned a great book called the Galston Psalter, which is now in the British Library. Galston is a place uh, on the Norfolk, southeastern Norfolk on the coast, near Great Yarmouth. And he had this book made around 1320. John de Warren, well, they didn't miss a trick in the Middle Ages. This is a pun uh, on his name, because if you look carefully, I hope you can see this, uh, you, you ought to be able to see a little Warren, rabbit Warren, little holes in the ground and the rabbits are jumping in and out of the rabbit warren. And you've got your usual hunting scenes and your grillises and your, your funny uh, uh, little gr grotesques, musicians, heraldry, the whole kit and caboodle is there. So the book is a way of self-inscribing the name of the author and some sense of identity. By the way, John de Warren uh, put it around a bit. He tried to divorce his wife. He ran off with a mistress, was not terribly popular in certain, certain circles. So uh, he knew a thing or two about this, this, this kind of thing. So it's not surprising that rabbits figure a great deal in these books. These are books made for young people. Uh, they've often got fertility on their mind. And in the Macclesfield sort of, there's a wonderful, wonderful soap opera between a dog and a rabbit. It's Tom and Jerry really, basically. And, you know, sometimes the mouse gets clogged and most of the time the cat gets clogged. In this case, it's a, it's, it's a dog. And eventually the dog gets sick of this rabbit and dispatches him in a joust. So here's the dog on horseback, very aristocratic. He skewers the rabbit, bunny falls off backwards, and then there's a bunny funeral um, with a priest, uh, with an aspergillium, holy water, two, two uh, bunny uh, coffin bearers and a bunny bearing the bells to uh, lead them through. So rabbits, fertility, hunting, all go together with a land-owning society. This is not exactly popular culture, but it's, it is, at any rate, a culture that the book commissions would have understood. And just in a few minutes, I want to get back to this question of, well, where did all this start, and why, why do these things find their way into these books? But I just want to make a few other points about how you can use these things, or how these things were thought to work, because they're not always about meaning. Sometimes they might be, in a sense. Here's a book from a university. It's not the kind of textbook that you use nowadays, but it's a book about the arts, the liberal arts, of which geometry is an important one. It's a treatise um, illuminated in Paris in the early years of the 14th century, uh, 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 late 13th century. And it's the treatise by Euclid, who was the most famous writer about geometry. Everybody used Euclid, the Greek writer in, in, uh, in the Middle Ages. And you can see it says Euclid at the top. And there's a hunt going on. Again, uh, there's a boar hunt, a dog, uh, an arrow being fired like this. You can see Euclid's geometry beautifully worked out on the border. There's a scramble at the bottom. There's a rabbit. What a surprise. There's a bird. What's going on here? The thing is, in university textbooks, uh, and like in Salter's and in books of ours, the margins help you find your way around. You will remember that there's a flat fish in the Macclesfield sort of because it's funny. If you teach, you know that humour gets the point across very easily. And here we have a, 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 a so to speak, a class book, a, an academic book, in which you have to find your way around. Now, invention, the idea of invention in the Middle Ages had to do with finding, in venere, to find, to discover. It's not making something up, it's finding something. And the word invenio is not far from the word venare, to hunt. There's a pun going on here. You hunt around in the book. You say you hunt around in your purse, you hunt around in your wallet, you hunt around. So hunting becomes a way of thinking about hunting out knowledge. It's not simply to do with an aristocratic pursuit. It's, it's a general metaphor that everybody will understand. Now, when these bunnies and dogs and everything were put into books, they weren't simply put in as a kind of dream or experiment or, or, or kind of, uh, how do I put it, free play of the imagination. 
they're, they're, they're thoroughly planned and we can prove that for two reasons. The first is that we've got incomplete books, here's a good one, that uh, show how the margins were planned in right from the start. This is a thing called the Metz Pontifical. Now this is a book for a bishop, you don't get more serious than this. A pontifical is a bishop's book and it's got instructions in red and uh, other things in black letter and, and you can see they've drawn in the pictures very carefully here here's the bishop and uh, the letters have all been drawn in and then there's a border and there's a rabbit and a dog it's all there right at the start they're planned and the second thing about all these things and this is true in parish churches and in choir stalls and in stained glass everywhere you never see them censored they're never censored why? Because they didn't offend sensibility. You know, it's a funny thing, but if you actually look for references to marginalia, what we now call marginalia in the Middle Ages, they never referred to them. They were always part of the main picture. There was never any language of marginality in the Middle Ages when it came to works, but I ha I've never been able to find a reference to them. And I find that very interesting because it kind of supports my idea that this is all really one way of thinking. So they're never censored and they're always planned as they are here in the Metz Pontifical, long before the color and the gold are put on. And in fact, when these things were made, if they were carved in churches or painted in books or done in wall paintings, they were measured by the yard. Uh, we know this from a book, here it is, it's the Nederine's Morale book. It's a, a sort of religious book of religious instruction, and it has no end of birds and other creatures. And this, this is made, uh, as I say, not in England, but in the Netherlands, around the same period. And uh, the, the, the artist who, did these little uh, doodles and drawings and wasn't doodling at all. He was getting them out of a copy book. He was measuring them by the yard and he did a kind of tally at the end. You've got 250 of these each at three threepence a go is the bill. And he presented his bill in Latin. So uh, these guys were literate and they were commercial. And that, this is a very important point about these books. They are commercial propositions. They're not free of the market. If you want to sell a book, if you want to make a book in a great bookshop in Norwich, or Paris or Oxford, you put beautiful things in it and this is how you sell them. Well, I was very interested in the idea of, and have been for a long time, the, the idea of nonsense. A diddle diddle, a cat over the cat fiddle, a cow jumped over the moon, the, the dog he laughed to see such fun and something ran away with the spoon. You all know, you've all got a nonsense poem tucked away somewhere. Nonsense is an art form. And I think we tended perhaps to take marginalia, not so much literally, but we tended not to see them as, as what they are, which is fun, but quite kind of wordplay fun, if you see what I mean. In a book uh, on the origins of English nonsense that explores all this by uh, Mel Malcolm, who's a scholar at Oxford, you can see three, he gives three definitions of nonsense, and they're, they're quite helpful in a way. Some kinds of nonsense can describe a world which is impossibly good, Utopia, it never comes into existence. Everything's as wonderful as could possibly be. You never find those in marginalia, funnily enough. The other is a world in which things are as bad, as awful as they might be. Uh, a dystopic world, a dystopian world, impossibly bad. And then there's a world in which everything is fantastically exaggerated, where everything's out of proportion, where everything is slightly nonsensical and the relationships of things are potty. The word of hyperbole in Greek, exaggeration. Think of that fish in the Macclesfield Psalter. Very few skates ever get to that sort of size. Deliberate exaggeration. I think most marginalia are like that. They're like hyperbole. They're like exaggeration. But they are a form of nonsense. They don't make truth claims about the world at all. We go back to our beautifully drawn and considered um, skate. Now, I said earlier on when we were looking at the washerwoman and the thief in the cloister of Norwich that monks approved of this kind of thing, and they clearly, quite clearly did. This book that we saw earlier on, A Psalter, the Peterborough Psalter, made for Peterborough Abbey, a wealthy and important abbey, with a beautiful abbey church, still there. Um, this book was made for Geoffrey of Crowland, an abbey, an abbot of uh, Peterborough a a a Abbey, a, a wealthy man, and I, I drew attention to the owl and the goat and the um, monkey riding backward on the goat. That's about 1300. Where do these things start? Where do they start? And the interesting thing is that we, you can find them sometimes in vernacular books. Um, this is an English register of law, law, for example. You probably won't be able to see it. It's a rotten picture. I'm sorry, but take it from me. There's a little English, English caption at the bottom, and the ass and the ape and the owl are drawn in there. And there's just a little, a little poem in English saying, you know, um, don't get worried about money. 
it, it's worth an a panacea now it's worth nothing it's you know it's a, it's a kind of image for something that's really not worth very much does that mean that the idea originated in the english language not really we know where it comes from we know where the first representations of this come from they come from the nave ceiling of peterborough abbey let's just go through i hope i can you, you can see all these as i scroll down i hope those are coming across is that all right Here's the, the nave of Peterborough uh, Cathedral, as it is now, after the Reformation. It has the biggest painted ceiling in the world from the Middle Ages. If you didn't know that, go and have a look. And it's divided into these lozenges that run down the middle of the ceiling. And over where the monks sat, here's the choir. That was all screened in at uh, this end of the church, which is the holy end of the church. I said earlier on, you'll always get the wildest margins, marginalia in, in the, the holy part of the church. Here you have the goat with the monk riding backwards and an owl on his paw like that so you've got that bit of nonsense and you get another thing which is an ass playing a harp well harp playing as we see is what Orpheus does or King David does in the Psalms that's harmony that's what the choir should sing like but the monks know better they know that playing song can go wrong and they can sound like a load of asses bray with with the harp um, making making a terrible din <clears throat> and that kind of humor I call it small group humour or enclosed group humour because you, you, you tend to find it first. Where does it start? You tend to find it first in small groups. Now, many of us work in offices. Most of you are not working in offices at the moment, but the likelihood is that if you're a schoolboy, if you're, if you're a schoolgirl, if you're a, a student at university, uh, if you work in an office, if you're in a monastery, if you're in a, an inn of court, if you're in a in a unit, in a, in a, I don't know, um, anyway, some small group, you'll have your in jokes, you'll have your little patterns of humour that get circulated and, and become very, very dear to you. And I call this small group humour. That is to say, there are things that may be shared by other groups, but they tend to start in enclosed societies, monasteries particularly, are very, very good. And the other place that they start, provably, is the universities. If you go to Oxford and to Paris, the two great universities in Northern Europe at that day, say middle of the 13th century, here are two books. We saw one earlier on on the right hand side. It's that um, book of Euclid made in Paris. It's a school book. And on the, on the left is a book made in a similar kind of style. This book was made in Oxford and it shows the Bible. It's the very opening of the Bible. It's the creation of the world. Um, with God. Uh, you could see tiny little figures in, in the borders like this. And then uh, here you've got the hunting scenes uh, in, in, in the uh, Euclid, but here, this is the beginning, this is creation itself. This is a university bookshop producing a beautifully illuminated Bible for well-off students. And uh, it shows all the things that God made right at the start of creation that got discontinued all the things that sort of failed and got evolved out, weird monsters, things like this, which were made at the same time as the beautiful birds and fishes and animals and Adam and Eve. All the things that simply couldn't make it. They aren't dinosaurs, but they are, you know, they, 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 were, rendered, they were rendered extinct. But the point is this, where do these border patterns and border little figures start? They start in bureaucracies and they start in the universities. It's student humour, a lot of this, so it seems to me. And then it works out through the monasteries and uh, out, out, out more generally. And there's another place that's quite important for this as I start to wind up my talk. It's law. In, in the Middle Ages, there was a huge industry. Lawyers were just as much disliked and thought sort of suspicious as, as, as they are nowadays. And law books were richly illuminated. And of course, the law is about order. It's about ruling. It's about getting things straight. Like Salters and Books of Ours, law books have uh, many of the best and finest marginalia. So in the Luttrell Psalter, the Book of Psalms on the left-hand side, you get these highly coloured and weird looking things, hundreds of them. You get exactly the same thing in law books. This is canon law, the law of the church. This was made in Bologna in the early 14th century, but it was then decorated in England. And the guy was the guy was given this you know this great beak and the pots and all the rest of it. So the Psalms, the Book of Hours, the Law Books, where authority is at its greatest, it immediately allows its opposite. And this isn't to do with subversion; it's to do again with this, the pleasure that people got at the time of setting up one thing against another for fun, as much as as much as anything else. Um, here's a, another Norwich Law Book. Uh, made in the 1330s or 1340s, which again has all sorts of weird and wonderful things. That's again to do with the law. 
Well, anyway, I, I don't want to go on forever uh, talking about all these different points because the simple fact is it doesn't matter what you make of these margins. You can make them what you like. They're fun. Uh, you can go into the cloister at Norwich and you can see this guy, he's, he's, he's had a capital from a bit of architecture knocked through his face like this. And he's got his nose turned up and he's grinning at us. He's in the Middle Ages, he'd be called a baboon. A baboon isn't a monkey um, at that time. It's a gob or a face or a mask. And to, ba to baboon is to chatter as an ape would chatter. Baboonery is to sort of is to go on at length, rather as I'm doing. I hope I'm not chattering, but you get the point. So baboons are faces. We live in on Zoom. We live in a world of baboons, everybody talking to one another. Uh, it's, it's the thing for our times. But the point is, you'll get them absolutely everywhere. It doesn't matter what you make of them. You can enjoy them and make of them exactly what you like. And I'm sure that's what happened in the Middle Ages. They're not there to tell you what to think. They're, to, they're there to tell you possibly how to think, uh, what questions to ask about things, and above all, they're there to, to make you buy the book and to be entertained as you slog your way through the Christian services and the book of Psalms. Well, um, I'm going to stop there. That's all, folks. As the cartoons say, here's a duck uh, in the Macclesfield Psalter, one of those lovely birds. I, I, I think I'd better stop there before I go quackers, ha, and let you ask some questions if you want to do that. But anyway, I hope you were able to see the slides, and it's been a real pleasure to talk about these things. I could go on about this all day, uh, but I'll spare you. <laughs> thank you very much. Professor Binsky, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And um, I know our viewers have really enjoyed that. Um, Professor, if I could just ask you to stop sharing your screen and we'll go into um, um, ask, asking questions. So we've had a couple of questions come in already. Um, right. We've got um, our first one here is, um, hello from South Africa. I love the detail of marginalia. What was the sense, when was the sense of humour lost? Tudor, Cromwellian or Victorian? Oh, ah, yeah. right. That's a, <laughs> that's, that's a really wonderful, wonderful question. And it's, it's, it, we don't think about why things stop. We, we, I've worried about th why things begin, but we don't worry about why they stop. Okay, uh, the serious answer to your question is that actually these things in the borders of books are very fashionable between 1250 and about 1350. They don't last very long. In the later Middle Ages, 1350, 1400, they're on, they tend to drop out. I think one reason, you know, since we, we've got to think about this, because we, we now know what, plague brings in terms of economic consequences. The Black Death in 1348 and 1347 53 across much of Europe killed off between a third and two thirds of the population. I mean, what we're su suffering at the moment is, is bad, but it was nothing as bad as that. And the point is that labor costs shot up. And it's very interesting that marginalia stopped around that time because I think, they, as I said to you, they could be measured out by the art. I think they simply became too expensive. So it's not that the sense of humor went, but I think they were regarded as a, as a, as a, as a luxury. And they were often in quite luxurious books. And so they stopped. Um, but, I, but I think to pick up the general direction of what you're saying, I think the sense of humor had started to fade certainly after the Reformation. I think the, the them and us, the kind of, you know, um, uh, straight-based idea of church where, where you're very well behaved and you know there's no colour and no humour and all that. So that had begun in the Middle Ages, to be sure. But it gets much, much, it's much different once the Calvinist and Lutheran dispensations take over in Europe. So the first answer is, did the sense of humour go in the Middle Ages? Probably not, but it was fading. It was unaffordable. And then um, the Protestant Reformation came along. And I don't, I, I don't have a confessional point to make about this. Um, the Victorians, uh, it's very interesting that one of the very few comments on these things ever before the 20th century college is from Lord Byron, the poet Byron, who said that there were uh, families who had books with these funny little things in borders. And um, I think in the 18th century, they probably thought they were hilariously funny. They had a sense of humor in the 18th century, okay. The Victorians, uh, the Victorians had no sense of humor at all. And they, uh, very interestingly, saw these, these marginalia as moralizing and often mad. They thought they were a symptom of ones in the lateral sort that I showed. They thought they were a symptom of kind of pathology. And that view, that view hung, up, hung around well into the 20th century. Eric Miller, the art historian who first published the lateral sort, talks about these, these, these things being the product of a sort of diseased mind. And of course they are. They're, they're the products of human imagination. But that view lasted on for quite a long time. And of course, there are many people, some of the best writing about Marcelli has to do with 
the political purchase that some people see them as having. I tend not to agree with that or, or say, yes, that's true, but it's not universally true. Of them. There, there are all sorts of ways of looking at them. So the answer to your question is humor, you know, let's face it, some people never have a sense of humor. I've, I've always tended to take a bright, bright, eye, bright view of these things, but um, I think certainly from the Reformation onwards. There you go. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, everyone, please do keep um, submitting your questions. Um, it's really great that you're engaging in this way. Um, Paul, we've had another one come in. Um, it's a bit similar to it. So you've already touched on when they disappeared. But what do you yeah. think um, today that they're a mission, um, so that the fact that they're not used anymore, what does it signify, do you think? Um, well, um, you, you mean, I don't quite understand. You mean a mission in the sense of a mission from art generally? or why we so, yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure that we do a them. I mean, really, honestly, I mentioned I mentioned Monty Python earlier on. Terry Gilliam got a lot of inspiration from um, medieval marginalia. In fact, if you're an art historian, you look at the Monty Python cartoons and you know where he's lifted them all from. It's very annoying. <laughs> Years ago, I said, I still love Monty Python. I, Terry, Terry Jones, do you remember Terry Jones? He's much loved. He asked me to be a picture researcher for, for Monty Python. I said no, because I was a bit pompous. And I regret having done that. I don't think we do. I, th I think we, I think we do have a different, possibly a different idea of, of humour, that humour is something parceled off from life in general. That we, have a, we take a very serious view of some things, and, you know, a very humorous view of others. And we tend to see humour as more subversive than I think they actually did. I think that the tendency to see marginalia as politically subversive uh, in the Middle Ages was very much a product of the 1980s and the sort of Thatcher Reagan years. And it may come back, but um, I don't think that's the only way of seeing it. And I, I so I, I think, you, you know, if you look around, you can see humour in this kind of way. And don't forget Gilray and Cruikshank and the great 18th and early 19th century British cartoonists. They don't make little monsters like this, but they love this kind of thing. I mean, the caricature and, and, and the grotesque. So it's never entirely faded away, but it would have a different role. And I think we take a more political view of it now than they did then. And you mentioned earlier about this whole idea about nonsense and it all being connected to that. Yeah. Do you think in some ways this is where the idea of sort of limericks has all, co all come yeah. from? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think that, um, I think it's, the, the point is, I call it the pleasure of unruling, that you make something quite strict, like a law book, the Psalms, which is the law, you know, that's the divine order, if you want, and you unrule it immediately. Um, and you get pleasure out of that, just as you get pleasure out of making up, making a limerick. Don't, isn't it fun to make, compose a little poem which takes the mickey out of somebody? You know, you can settle a score. <laughs> right, right. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's amusing. And I, I, what, what I'm appealing for in my, in my talk in these very difficult times is that we should take a more lighthearted view of some of these things. We can be a bit over serious about them. And um, it doesn't mean they weren't important. Humour was very important. Nonsense was important. It was a tool to remind us that not everything makes sense you know, and that we can't understand everything. And for those viewers of us watching that, um, if you're interested in limericks, um, do look up Princess Margaret, because she had a wicked sense of humour, and um, she composed some marvellous limericks, which you can find very easily by Googling um, some of her compositions. Um, we've had some more questions come in. So um, you've said that monks enjoyed marginalia on scenes of everyday life, and that often the wildest scenes were found in the cathedral choir. Um, but do you see any distinction between how those ideas are applied in the local parish church and the cathedral? Is there a distinction? Well, it, part of it has to, may have to do with where, where we think these things start. And, and this is a very, very interesting question because, you know, you can take the view that a lot of these things kind of bubble up out of folk culture. The only problem is how do you know what folk culture is? You go by what's written down. Who tends to write it down? But people who are literate, that means monks. Other, other, other professionals, uh, other literate people. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, well, I think that, uh, that my first thought is that this is part of a common culture, that actually there isn't too much difference really between what goes on in a parish church. Don't forget, parish churches are often quite wealthy places. They've got quite, quite a lot of clergy. They've got, um, you know, choral establishments. They could be quite grand places. But yeah, I mean, I take the point, and if, if the, po the point is to say that, that these can be understood at pretty well every level, the whole point about them is they're not telling you what to think. You can make of them what you will. They're funny. And therefore, you can't, you can't control that. Why should you? You know, it's ludicrous. You don't try to control, you know, that, that, that which is ridiculous. They didn't. They never censored it. So were they read differently in different communities? Of course they were because everything inevitably inevitably is. And I think the key thing, keynote, is not to lay down the law about their meaning. They don't just have meaning. They create an experience, and that will differ from person to person. But 
Um, in the end, you know, we're all human. And uh, there are a lot of things that link uh, the classes together. And I'm not pretending that there wasn't social conflict and social difference in the Middle Ages, far from it. Um, but I do want to emphasize that in a lot of the things that I was talking about today, it's quite, up, it, you know, how can I put it? They're, they're pretty upper class things. Most people never got to see a sort of book about us for heaven's sake. You know, they will have seen the little things done in the parish churches. Absolutely. And they will have made of them, who knows? So I think there probably were differences. Thank you, Paul. Um, sure. Next question here. Um, were medical textbooks produced with illustrations such as these, or purely were they anatomical designs? Oh, that's a great. <laughs> well, I, I've supervised or, or, or had, you know, known PhD students who've worked on, on medical uh, textbooks, and uh, I, um, uh, offhand, it's a very good question. You don't tend to get so many. I mean, it's amazing what a preponderance happen in the religious books, not in the science books. Science books don't tend to have them. Um, the anatomical treatises that you get in the Middle Ages, the um, uh, bone man and skin man and nerve man and vein man, always, always wonderful diagrams that you get, don't tend to have marginalia in, in them, actually, I think. Um, I wouldn't want to mislead you, but I don't think they're so prominent in books made, made for, the, for what we now call the sciences, that kind of, um, that kind of inquiry. But I don't want to get, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to mislead you. There's, a, there's a, a, still a very useful book by somebody called Lillian Randall, which is double L at the end, Lillian Randall, images, on the, images in the margins of Gothic manuscripts, and that'll give you a breakdown of where they happen. I don't have them all in my mind at the moment, but I don't t they don't tend, I think, to happen in uh, medical books, but what's to stop them, on the other hand? <laughs> I hope that answers um, your question there. Um, thanks for um, asking them. Um, we've had more come in. Um, so part of the Prester John legend is about fantastical animals and nonsense creatures existing in his kingdom. Would yeah. the audience at that time recognise them as light-hearted, humorous and entertainment, as with marginalia, or do you think they believed that they actually existed in exotic and faraway places? Oh yeah, I, I, I think um, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, the, the wonders of the marvels of the East, all, all the, the world, the world of far-off wonders of, 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 of any type, which fed the fed the medieval imagination. I'm pretty certain they were taken dead seriously. Actually, I mean, <clears throat> there was there was quite a widespread belief that the, that at the ends of the earth um, were uh, all sorts of cr weird creatures, um, uh, which. Uh, which were to be converted to Christianity, or you know, we hear about this in the mission of the apostles and so on, things to the ends of the earth. No, I think that was a different thing. I think that has to do with the, the general ordering of God's creation. I don't think they were taken lightheartedly at all. I think they, those things were really out there, like elephants, you know, or crocodiles, or all these, all these other things. I just make a small point, which I should have mentioned on route. Do you know the majority of books of beasts, allegorical, il il illustrated books about beasts in the Middle Ages, the yeah, majority of them are English. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I, I don't want to fall into a kind of cliche of saying, you know, stereotype the English are an animal, a nation of animal lovers, but it is interesting how, how many uh, were. But a lot of books, a lot of beasts in books were inaccessible until they actually turned up, which an elephant did once in the mid 13th century. Louis IX sent an elephant to Henry III and he kept it chained up at the Tower of London. And they thought it was a meat eating animal. Poor thing. They fed it meat and it died. And they had to bury it in, 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 a, in a trench at, uh, in the Tower of London. Matthew Paris, the monk, chronicler, does a wonderful drawing of this poor elephant with a keeper with a stick trying to keep it under control. And, you know, these, this was a fantastic animal that turned up. So, of course, they were real. They could turn up. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, you mentioned there about drawings. We've had a question that came in. Um, could you tell us more about the materials used? Inks, pigments, vellum, paper, and what of pens? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, this is a huge subject. I can't answer this straight off. Uh, you should get hold. Uh, there, there, are great, there are great books. Um, there's a lovely book by Christopher Hamill on, on, called Medieval Illuminators. That'll tell you how they made the ink, how they made the pens, how they prepared the parchment or vellum, sheepskin, um, ink from oak gall, gold leaf, um, <clears throat> uh, tempera paint mixed with egg. Um, I, don't know where to, I don't know where to start. It's, it's such a huge, a huge issue. But of course, the the, in the fire books, you know, the materials are precious beyond belief. The most expensive pigment is blue, ultramarine. That's, that's used quite a lot. Um, gold, inevitably, goes in first. So they're very, very costly books. And the keynote in all these books also is, talking of pens, is the script. Because a book is about a text. The main thing is that the text must be accurate. And what goes in subsequent to the text 
doesn't have to be accurate in the same way, but it, you know, it matters, but it's always the text that matters. So you have to have a great nib and you have to have a very formal training as a scribe. And some of the, I could have talked about some of the script you saw in those books, but they take a lot of training and they're very, very expensive to do. Um, another question here, snails are often depicted in marginalia. Is there some significance to this or were they just seen as humorous? Oh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, yes, um, is the, is, isn't it interesting that people want the significance of it? Um, and what I'm saying is, don't worry too much about the significance of it. The thing is, when you look at it, what you, what, 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 what sensation, what experience do you get? Um, yes, I think they were often thought, thought of as sexual animals. Um, I think they, they were thought of as, as creatures that, that should be small and vulnerable, but they're quite often shown in some of these great illuminated books as absolutely enormous monsters with great sort of, um, you know, eye stalks and worse in the shells, scaring the pants off men in armour who should know better. It's rather like our skate and the man frightened by the skate. So they, they were a funny mixture of, of earthy, sort of phonic, uh, uh, sexy imagery on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, cock, they had great comic potential, obviously but they were thought to be vulnerable and therefore in the, in the medieval <clears throat> world turned upside down where big becomes small and small becomes big and the vulnerable becomes, you know, the, the, the tri triumphant and so on. Uh, everything can be turned on its head. So I tend a little bit to steer, I hate to do this because it looks as look like I'm not answering the question, but I tend to steer a little bit around meaning questions because the, you can find a dozen meanings for things. Uh, often it depends on the context, how it's placed, how it's used. And um, I do try to emphasize uh, the experience. Um, thanks for everyone to start asking questions. I've had three more that comes in. I'm going to finish after those three questions, I think. So, um, Paul, on to our final three questions here. Um, yeah. First one is, have you ever looked at stonemason graffiti in the form ridiculing, ridiculing the clergy? I've heard that there is some on the roof of Canterbury Cathedral. Oh, uh, uh, um, no, it's a short answer. I, I haven't, and I'm sure there are. Um, but how would you know that they're ridiculing the, 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 the clergy? Um, isn't it interesting? I, I, maybe they exist. How would you ever tell? Unless they were, they showed a silly bishop or somebody being prodded. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm sure, I'm sure that's possible. And I do, I think sometimes they, of course, they were subversive and they do, they do ridicule things. Uh, uh, the Masons tended to get away with it, but I don't know the specific art examples you have in mind, I'm afraid. So, um, let, let's hear more about those. Brilliant. Um, and our second question is, what, if any, relationship between art um, of dooms and the everyday art, do we form, um, do we, from perspective, overestimate the fearful impact of dooms? Well, um, look, it, it, one thing that holds all these things together is something like this. The image of a doom, which, what by, by, by the doom, it should be explained that you mean the image of a last judgment, yeah? which will be often in a parish church painted over the chancel arch, you get the crucifixion of Christ and over it will be a, the, the, the separation of the good and the bad at the last judgment by Christ, the sheep and the goats, all those things. Notice sheep, goats, huh? animal imagery. Um, the doom is, 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 is about instructive, it's about the virtue of mercy uh, uh, and uh, about the instructive power of fear. So there's an emotional aspect to the doom. And um, although we don't want to get the emotional life of things too much out of proportion. I think art historians are much, and anthropologists, historians of religion, are now much more interested in this, this question of what, what experience, what emotions are these things trying to instill? And so they're, they're connected in a way, you know, the, 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 as we saw in, in the little Macclesfield sort of the, the man on the deathbed with death there and, and the fall of pride, all very serious things. And opposite is a man taking the piss. You know, can those things be opposed to one another? O obviously not. It's not that one is like relief to the other, ho-ho, if you see what I mean, but that, um, that in the medieval mindset, polarities, binaries that we think of as binaries, are often, often connected uh, like that. And so fear goes with pleasure. Do you see the point? And we, we must be careful to try to think about how those things were balanced. You know, they were very medicinal in the Middle Ages. They thought of the human body as an organism that had to be kept in balance by the humours. And so they always thought that if you had X, you had to have Y to balance it. And if you get that idea of justice, of balance, of the scales, just everything is, is, is in due proportion, you get a sense of how things work. And they're always keeping it in balance. But the point about a balance is it can tip, yeah? Too much of something, too much, you know, it gets out of your, your, your body's like that. That's how they thought. 
And um, so, you know, too much fear and the message doesn't go. You need a bit of, a bit of pleasure to get the message across as well. Art is there to persuade you. Brilliant. And well, I think this is a really good question to finish on. Um, um, if you were to go in to produce a modern day book about yourself, what would yours look like or express in the marginalia? <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can't answer, uh, this is a family show isn't it yeah um uh, <laughs> uh no I, well god like, that's a great thought oh don't tempt me oh it'll be full of appalling cartoons of all the people i've written with me off over the years and you know oh yeah you'd have a whale of a time it'd be great what a wonderful idea i'll do that next time thanks for the tip <laughs> Well, uh, again, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for joining um, this lunchtime, lunchtime lecture. Um, later on today, we're going to be posting details of two further lectures that are coming up over the, further, over the coming weeks. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Christina Welch from the University of Winchester, who's going to be talking to us about contextualising carved cadaver monuments in England. So do join us at next Thursday at 1pm. But as we said at the start of this lecture, if you've enjoyed this, please do consider making a donation securely either on our website, which is visitchurches.org.uk, or text CCT to 70331 to make a gift of £3. But again, thank you so much for everyone for joining this lecture. Thank you.